Hello and welcome to Ultra TV, the cinematic map to Ultra Magazine's compass. Today I'm in the Western Lakeland Fells and in a few short minutes I'm going to drive up the valley and meet up with running legend Joss Naylor. I'm going to talk to him about the book that he's got coming out very soon and I'm also going to talk to him about some of his accomplishments in the sport. This is an interview that I'm really excited to be conducting and I hope you're going to enjoy it too. And don't forget to click below to like and also to subscribe to the channel. Josh, thank yes. you ever so much for inviting me to your home here. It's in a pleasure. Glorious Gosforth. So, you've got a book out. Yes. So uh, tell me all about it. What, 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 well, what motivated you to do that? Huh? Well, I've been thinking about it for a couple of years, really, maybe longer. And uh, it's something that was very, very special, was the Lakes Mayors and Wilders. Yeah. Because it got into my mind I was going to run it. And it was time, you know, I had two jobs. I was running a farm and uh, at Sellafield. And I was working with the apprentices at the time. And I thought, well, it's a good idea to get them involved, to, you know, to collect a bit of money yeah. for sponsorship, you know, because I do all, you know, all sorts of charities over my lifetime. And when we do these longer runs, it's nice if you can make a bob or two for an unfortunate charity. Mm -hmm. So we did that. Right. I, and uh, it took off well, really. The weekend before, when I did my training, you know, I got over, I would say, a good 80% of the, the course in, in those two Sundays. Right. I, and the little bit I didn't get it in, in I ran from Wasdale over to Annadale, which took care of that, and I had one of the most beautiful runs I think I ever had, because it was a sunny, lovely evening when I come back from work, and uh, I looked at the shape at Grainle on the way back, and then it bowed a little. And just as I come up the cow pasture, I thought, well, I'll just have a run over to Hennadale. And from there, in an hour, I was standing on the bridge just above Hennadale Lake. Right. And it was just like floating on air. And the views were so lovely, there wasn't a soul about. And I stood on the bridge and looked around for about a minute. And then, in another 40 minutes, I was up over with my red pig, down with Lake Barry Tarn, to uh, Cunwick Water. Right. And I was just standing there in awe, looking back up to Butter Mayor Lake. Just something very, very special. Yeah. And then from there, I just nipped home, <laughs> up over Scarth Gulf, Black Sail, and down the road. And it was just so magic, you know. Mm -hmm. I was always running on air, my body was just right, and the times I was knocking off, well, it was just unbelievable. Sounds and magic. Aye, it was absolute magic. You just took the words out of my mouth. Yeah. Aye. And, uh, you know, that sort of carried on that week, you know. And on the morning of the Lakes Mears and Wards, I set off from uh, Loudwater. And it was just like a day of paradise. You know, we had mm -hmm. nothing but decent running weather till about, I would say, midday probably. And then it got really, really warm. And it had gone, come towards night time. There was a bit of cloud, high cloud come over. As we come into Keswick, there was a little bit of drizzle. And then uh, as we are going towards Overthwaite, you know, it was pitch dark, we run with the car lights on. And uh, going up to Overthwaite, it's about a maybe four or five mile, and there's about a thousand foot of climbing in that four or five mile wow, on the road, okay. and there wasn't a word spoken, <laughs> and I was determined to run it all like, you know, uh -huh. I was dug in at that point, and uh, we got to Overthwaite Water, and the apprentices had the lights shining right down to the lake, and it was just, just magic. Right. Right. So for those people that aren't familiar with Lakes Mears and Waters, do you want to just kind of tell people what, what it was you actually achieved that day? Aye, it was about a 105 mile, and uh, I don't know how many thousand feet, maybe about 22 or 3,000 mm. foot of climbing, like, you know. Yeah. And it was just like a dream come true. Aye, and uh, it's now, there's a shorter version of it uh, that uh, the Killy Ratty lads did. Right. But 
that didn't go to Kentmere Water. Like Kentmere, it's got a question mark against it. Well, I didn't know. I didn't look at anybody's uh, plans or routes that they'd done beforehand. I just decided where I was going to run and, and run it like, you know. Right. And it's, I did it sort of the way around there, did it? But yeah. I went to Kentmere twice, like, you know. Right. And at one point, me uh, backup team didn't come. I was standing there, lake at uh, Wind Windermere Lake it was, at, at Waterhead, up to my knees in the water, <laughs> and I waited there for about ten minutes, and the support car didn't turn up. Right. So instead of going round the w path up in the wood just above uh, Waterhead, I ran down and to what they call Low Wood. It's a big hotel. Yeah. Maybe a couple of miles down the road, and then. Took the road back out into Trout Lake, uh, Windermere. Right. And then uh, picked the path up there again. Did you have words with them when you found them? Well, not really. <laughs> it's just one of them things. Yeah. You know, I added, added another three or four miles to it. Like, right. I, but you know, it's, it, it was no effort really. I was just running away, relaxing, mm -hmm. covering the ground at a nice pace. Mm -hmm. And then when they did turn up, I was pleased to get some dry socks on. But when you set off with you, Shoes full of water, like you know. One thing about it, yeah, feet get light as you go along, like. Yeah, true. Uh, true. Uh, but it was one of those days where I, you know, and and the bad patch and no blisters, nothing like it. Right, just wow. A dream come true, like. And, you know, I hope that it reflects in that book and gives a lot of people a lot of pleasure. You know. And the idea is, is that people kind of uh, use the book and follow the route that you did, and kind ah, of. that's you, right. You, you, because I think in the book you make, you kind of you, there's some notes about. Um, kind of uh, how you're feeling when you're doing the route, some of the things, you know, some of the kind of selections that you chose in terms of going from different waters and different lakes and that sort of thing. That's right. Yeah. I, you know, some of the areas you had to contour through, some of you go straight up over the top and others you had to sort of, you know, make a, a, route, a big change of the route because the two lads probably were with you that weren't made for running like, you know, yeah. and they were just strong walkers. Uh, now from goat's water to uh, small water, mm -hmm. you know, we put a bit of extra loop on to just make it pull the contour around so if they had to, to climb, you know, up over the Connish Knoll Man sort of thing. Right. Because the lower legs, you know, would probably have seized up by the time we got up that pace. But, yeah. Uh, but it's just something you, you look back on and it was just a marvellous day. Right. And the book's available for pre-order so people can get, get hold of it if they want to. That's and, right. Yeah. I, it, uh, they get it through Sisson or uh, uh, what they call the other study? Waterstones. Waterstones. Yeah. I, you know, and there'll probably be other, uh, you know, bookshops that probably say this and uh, say, well, we'll get a hard end of that and we'll, we'll you know, like says, shops in Keswick, you know, but uh, could, could stock it. And there's a you know a big uh, number of people in Keswick every day, and there'll be a number, you know, would like to see a, a good array of photographs of all the lakes, meres, and waters, because mm. you know the photographer did them as a was a top photographer, right? And they get a lot of pleasure out of just looking at the photographs, like you know. Brilliant. Uh, okay, so you spoke a little bit there about your kind of your training run before the lakes, meres, and waters. And I just one thing that interests me about kind of talking to um, talking to, to runners who've been around for a while, with all due respect, uh, um, was kind of how, how things have changed in terms of preparation. So you did a couple of recce runs and you knew the area well because obviously you'd lived there all your life. That's right. But uh, kind of how, how, for, not just for Lake Mears and Waters, but for all the big events, how did you kind of train and prepare for those? Because these days you've got, you know, you've got support crews, you've got people who look after, you know, sponsors, kit sponsors. What, what was it like back, back in your day? Well, we're not, nothing like that. There was just one of the instructors, you know, I went into uh, training when I first went there and they were all apprentices, like, you know, yeah. and one, they said a couple of the uh, training staff that took the job on, one called Dave Elliott, and he was a really good organiser, like, you know, he'd done a lot of Duke of Edinburgh award schemes and quite a few of the, you know, the apprentices that uh, come out that day and helped. They had done the Duke of Edinburgh award schemes, and they, they were very good, you know, apprentices, and they were just good company to have, yeah. putting along with you, like, you know. And uh, 
I'd run it through, you know, good athletes and it was just a good team. Mm -hmm. um, so did you did you handpick them or did they volunteer? Did they just kind of they were running? just volunteers, right. all one of them. I didn't put any arms up the backs or out like that. They just come along willingly. And I, they were just a good team. Right. Um, so out, out of all the kind of runs that you've done, and obviously you know you your pedigree speaks for itself. You know, kind of catalogue after catalogue of kind of you know extensive challenges that you've accomplished. Is there one particular that sticks out as being your favourite or one that being the most challenging? Uh, when you look back, uh, it's the ones that you're doing adverse weather. Right. I know when I did the 63 peaks, I started at the campsite at West Lane, and the mist was down to the wall, you know, where you're going on to you, butter. And the rain was coming straight down. Yeah. I, and 20, about 23 hours after when I finished, we come out of the mist on Ling Mallet and just to come over the stile and the rain was still coming down in steroids. And my hands were all swollen, my face was swollen, just with the sheer pelting of rain and, yeah. you know, in storm on your face. And everywhere was just running like gutters, going up paths and that sort of thing. Mm. We come in a langle and what I was standing on the road and, the, you know, it was hard, couldn't hardly get off the road because of the way the rain coming onto it. Right. And it was the same on top of Dunmail Railway coming there that night. And I had two cags on, you know, and two lots of leggings. Yeah. And, you know, you were just in so maintained body heat, like. So um, what kind of gets you around then? It's just stubbornness. I mind up a month, I think. Yeah. I, uh, and I think being fairly light and wiry, like, you know, you, you just got stuck in, accepted it, and the way things were on the day, like, yeah. you know. It's like Sabrina, Sabrina's got a good body clock. Yeah. Uh, she gets stuck in. It doesn't matter what the throw at her. She just keeps accepting it and marching on. Yeah. And that's what you've got to do when you're, you know, doing them things and the, the odds are against you. Mm -hmm. uh, Talk me through, because you did... Pikes Peak, didn't you? Aye. How, how did that come about? Because that's if you look at all kind of your 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 running history, that one that sets aside as being kind of an international event. Aye. Of... Well, it, it, it was a disaster, you know, from start to finish, because I knew nothing about the train over there, and I went out there, and the uh, atmosphere was down to my all time low. Of four, there was no moisture in the air. Like how do you know that maybe say eighty five or six, if, you know, that'll be sort of where the moisture levels are in there. But out there it was an all time low, and if if you did twenty mile, you had to drink ten pints of water to put your body fluids and put yourself back to right. Wow. Well, I didn't know that, and I, I went to Pike's Peak for a run one day, and uh, I had a mouthful of water out of this stream going up. And then when I seen where this septic tank water went in this little stream, I just couldn't drink any more of it, like, you know. I think I got a, a drink in the cafe on top of Pikes Peak. But, you know, he didn't know anything about dehydration and things like that. Mm. And on the morning of the run, it, everybody just wouldn't, wouldn't run strong. I had no strength in it, like. Right. And I got to the top when he went through, I think it was 12,000 feet, yeah, it was just as though somebody was draining your brains around with a hammer going up, you know, the thudding your head was serious. And then he was sat down on top and had a drink for about five minutes, five or six minutes. And coming back down, I got to run quite well, like, and I think I broke the record by six or seven minutes mm -hmm. coming down, but going up, oh, God. And they were giving drinks out at one spot, and they knew where the water was coming from. And uh, anyways, they give us a bottle and there's nothing in, you know, one of them plastic coloured bottles. And, and uh, I didn't get a drink at all at the, the drinking point. And I was dehydrating very fast, right. like. But uh, I finished about sixth overall, but coming down, I broke the record. It'll probably been broken again, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it went. Yeah. Just let the brakes off and went. Right. Uh, and how did you get to... How did you get to go over there? Did you choose to go? Did they invite you over? I got in, it was probably through Chris Brave, like, you know, I said I wanted to go. 
we tried to get out with the uh, RAF because I think John Wilde and uh, there was three of, of that team, you know, there were international cross country runners. I think they went and they're in the RAF like, and I thought they'd probably take me as baggage, but anyway, <laughs> so they wouldn't allow it. Right. So I just had to get out the best way I could. Make your own way over. Uh, yeah. I had a great experience, like. Mm -hmm. So what are the what are the changes you've seen in the sport then over the years, Josh? Because when did you start running back? I uh, nineteen sixty when I ran the first mountain trial. Yeah. I, uh, and it, it there's been a big change around in in uh, gear, like you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know there was a sort of thermal wear of, of a type in them days, but. The lightweight day of the day is just something very, very special. Like, mm. and the running shows now, there was a, a running show called the Dadis Cross. It sort of come from Scandinavian, one of the Scandinavian countries. I think it was a cross uh, out in dating show. And most of the uh, fell running shows today, they sort of got that design and more or less similar to tread it on the bottom. Right. I, I know one of the best treads now is uh, Scots, mm -hmm. you know, they've got a tread and you wouldn't look think when you look at it, but I know the other day I was out and it was really wet and greasy and as long as you stepped straight on the shoe, the grip and grip very well, like, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. But you know, all the running shoes today, they, they've got either a good firm type of stud or uh, a good design at the bottom, like, but that one, you know, you can go on the road with it and, you know, anything. Yeah. And it, it just seems as though it's a good all round track, like you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and what about your waterproofing stuff? I mean, you mentioned when you did your when you did that run, your sixty three, and you ended up with kind of double cagoules on. Ah, uh, well, well, a lot of them cagoules in them days, what went more or less right through. Yeah, you might they might turn water for a week but after that, <laughs> you know, uh, and you you had to put two two on to get a decent, you know. Some that would probably turn it a bit, but uh, it was one of those disgusting black nights. Yeah. I uh, we come off uh, top of our eyes on a good compass bed in Sergeant Man, and there's three or four of us that had actually knew that area like back of our hands, and I bet we we're on Sergeant Man three or four times before we accepted it was it, you know, because when you come off off there on, on a good straight line, the first thing you hit, because you know it was taken off the map. You know the uh, bad is like yeah. I uh, and anyways, we eventually after about twenty five minutes, we decided it had to be a sergeant man. Right. Uh, There's not it, much in between the two, is there? No. No. <laughs> it was just so black, and you know, it was, rain was just coming in steroids. Like and, there's so many things we, I mean, kind of we take for granted these days, aren't we? I mean, just thinking about you talking about it being a black night and kind of ink black. What? What was your what what light did you use? Did you have like a handheld torch? Was it a, uh, a big they're just, torch? They're just more or less good torches, like you yeah. Know. Uh, you know, and we had extra couple of hours of darkness because of you know the thickness of the mist. And yeah. There was no chance for moon or out getting through. Like, and we got back into Langle Bottom, and it it was just the same. But going up onto Pike of Blisket, it you know the mist rather broke a little, like you know. Yeah. Uh, but until we got home, it was just. Just the same. Yeah. I uh, just could, could not believe it. Pretty bleak over the top. So it was bleak. Out, it? Yeah. We never saw any soul, <laughs> apart from the ones that was turned out to help us. Like. Yeah. I uh, just, just unbelievable. Amazing. Uh, uh, but it's strange. I mentioned this many a time. We're going. I was going up on a cold pike, and the passage was slightly behind us, and uh, I looked across the cairn, and there was this. Just like sitting looking at you, this bloke in a sort of a orangey coloured uh, waterproof set, you know, and good boots. Right. And he had hood on, like, you know. Just sat there. He was just standing looking in the rain, you know. And I said to him, I said, You've had a bloody good start this morning, mister. And I took my eyes off him to run across the cane. There was nothing there. And I thought, Well, if I say out to this, <laughs> my pace of the Think that book has gone crack or something yeah. like that. So, <laughs> Be locking you up. No, so I just, uh, you know, I let it go by. Yeah. But, you know, I thought about it many, many times after, like. Uh, Strange, isn't it? Uh, it was. But he was in a 
real good Ellie Elson, you know, of Cag and Bottoms. And right. He dressed up for the job. And uh, mm -hmm. you can see him yet, like I say, look, and he's probably early 30s, you know, with a real fair complexion. Uh, Amazing. But he was just as plain as you are sitting yeah. there, like there was no, I wasn't imagining anything. It was just an image that appeared. And, uh, so you know, boy. Wow. But his girl sat there. <laughs> well, if anybody's watching this who knows the guy, he sat in a full orange cagoule uh, on, on a can, <laughs> talks about seeing Josh Naylor running by. Maybe you can get in touch so you know you won't, uh, you won't imagine it. No. You know, it's just one of those uh, things, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is there any running, is there any challenge or any run that you haven't done which you thought, kind of reflecting back, you would like to have done? Uh. I wouldn't say there was really. No. I, you know, anything that's sort of come in my mind, I've been lucky enough to, yeah, you yeah. know, go along and, and do it like. Yeah. I, like, I'd like to run a few more Manx marathons. I loved that race, but it was a bad time, like, you know. Yeah. I, it's a wrong time of year, like. And early on now. When I, wrong time of year from the farming point of view. Aye, it? it was farming, yeah. and then, you know, as time went along, it had too many, yeah. too much wrong. And, uh, it was just only because you could nip down and get a flight across the Tile of Man for 25 quid. Yeah. But, you know, the first one we went down, there was no way we could get across because the planes weren't flying. There was It was in mist and it never cleared, so we had to go around with Liverpool. So we didn't get to bed that night. Get on the boat. 11 o'clock or something at night. And then by the time we got a taxi up to uh, Douglas, it, it, you know, Where's the, where's the, because it, it runs up over Snaefell, doesn't it, the Banks one? Ah, uh, it starts at Douglas. It starts at Douglas, does it? Ah, uh, it runs up over the Northwood Earl and then Snaefell and then right. Golden. Uh, and then, you know, to go to Bradley, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Uh, and then back into Port Mary. Right. Uh, oh, so it's, it's kind of, right, okay, Snaefell and then it runs down. Uh, you go through Peel. Go through, through Peel. Uh, over Peel Hill and down that's that way. Right. Uh, Blimey. But it, it's just it's just the most lovely thing to do, yeah. like I and uh, I think I ran about four or five, five I think I ran like that. You know, very lucky, but to do that. But it, you know, it's something I would have liked to have just kept kept going back to. Yeah. I just it was just something very special to do, like you know. It's a nice place, isn't it? There's the uh, the Josh Naylor challenge. Ah, that's right. How did that come about? That chap may decided one night at work. It would make a nice, nice thing to do because it was more or less the backbone of the, the Lake District. Yeah. And the views, you know, on a good day, are spectacular. And you know, if you can come over a pillar, and the Scots and the Aircock and under Sea Talon, at a certain time, when the sun's going down over the Solway, and you can see all the Scottish Hills, you know, and the Solway and the Isle of Man, you know, if it's just that light, right light. It's some very magic, you know, and the people who catch it at that time when the weather's perfect, they'll enjoy it, and it's just something very special to do. Yeah. And they've got to be at 50 before they can do it, mm -hmm. you know, which limits the number of people who's going to do it, you know, and want to do it. So some years we have maybe, we have up to 20 do it, and some years we have maybe, maybe 14, 15, you right. know, but it's... I can't see it ever taken off to be overcome by like the Bob Graham's getting to be. Mm. Uh, because uh, the first age group at 50, you know, they've only got 11, 12 hours to do it. And they've got to be quite fit to do it. Like I said, that makes it harder than the Bob Graham, like, you know. Yeah, because uh, it starts at Pooley Bridge, doesn't it? It finishes does, aye. Uh, whilst out. Aye, uh, and yeah. finishes at Greenville Bridge. Greenville Bridge, uh, right. It's about... 48 mile or something like that. 12 hours. Aye. So, you know, it's just a nice average mm -hmm. uh, for a fit young fellow, at least when he's come 50 and he has no injuries and he's running well. Like, yeah, because mm. yeah, you, you, you try and see everybody that finishes, is that right? Aye, uh, if I'm yeah. here, I, yeah. I, I go up and see them in. Aye. Right. I've missed two first ones this time. And uh, there was one coming last Friday and he had a tremendous support, you know, and they think they win the bloody gold medal when they come in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's something very special like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, but the other one on Saturday was just a bit unfortunate. He, uh, 
I think you maybe underestimated. He'd done the Bob Graham a year or two ago, and he thought he could get away with it. But right. he said it was hard, much harder than the Bob Graham, mm -hmm. like, and he just run out of time in about half an hour, like. Right. I, and he was a fifty-year-old, so you know he had fifteen hours. But another couple of years, he'll have uh, another five hours. Like. A bit of extra time. Aye. So. So were you two kind of sitting in the pub, and you just decided. Um, to sketch it out, or how did it come well, about? Work, weren't we? Oh, we had a, I think Toddy had his map. We need to look up yeah. It was just decided to just time to put, put something like that on. Yeah. Uh, and anyways, was it the following night? Did did you drop me off it? No, I did a couple a couple of weeks. Later. What happened was, I knew what the route should be, because at the time he, he just lived at Greendale Bridge. Um, just outside Greendale Bridge, so it was a good place for it to finish. So we just decided, well, where should it start? And bridge to bridge got in our way. So then, we got Pearly Bridge, you come over High Street Ridge, down to Kirkson Pass, up over the Dumno Rays, then to Stye Head, and then finish at Greendale Bridge. So then it was just a matter of putting the route in among that, wasn't it? Oh, that's right. That, that, that uh, just knew it so well. Uh, um, and so we just decided then well that looked a good route and of course just being just said well, well i'll have to go and give it a run so he's right about the following week when we were on rest days i took joss and colin dawson his son-in-law at the time up the pearly bridge and then i picked them back up against dumb mill and they run that section which is the first two sections and they said yeah that'll do us and then i think the following night you run up from wasdale over to dumb mill and then come back again just Aye. to make sure that was right, which Aye. you would do. Aye. Um, and after that, we decided, yeah, this will this will go. And then so you picked a day, didn't you, that you would run it all. And just can pick the story up from there because it was one of the worst days. He talks about that 62, 63 peaks in 24 hours. But <laughs> this was just as bad that day. It was disgusting. You wouldn't have took a dog for a walk, would you? No. It was like... Coming up High Street, it was gale force wind. Right. Aye. And we dropped in off Thorns at Bacon. We got a bit of shelter there, like. And then we've gone out of up Red Screes, and then we've, we're more or less into it again. But once we sort of got heading up towards uh, top of High Hayes, eh, if I hadn't opened, then you thought we'd been shut out of a gun. Uh, it was bloody hard. Was you could hardly stand up, uh, and it was like ice. Yeah. And uh, you know, when when we come in at Kirkson, they were feeding us there, like you know, so the biscuit and a cup of tea. And Colin, I don't know what Colin had, but he, you know, was a big lad. And on top of Dun Mill, there was someone there, same team with their cake and tea. I said to Colin, I'll not bother. I'll just jog away on the old catches. And Colin stopped and had his bit of cake and some of it. And anyways, I said to Colin, I said, I'm getting fed at Esk Pike. I says, Esk Rose. Esk Rose. Toddy and uh, John Graham's fetching his uh, food out. Uh, when we got there, <laughs> they said, yeah, but the food's gone. He said, we're more, <laughs> we're, we're more in need of it than you, Tim. <laughs> that's, that's too early, Chris. Aye. We, 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 we just rightly like says we were spotting Josh at, at Escores. So he comes from S Pike down to Escores, then he's up to Great End and then down to Stayed. And we said, We'll run that last section with you, Josh. And best laid plans me and John James gets to Wasdale Head, parks the car up, looks up in the clouds, yeah, it's going to be pretty damp up there. Not knowing it was absolutely horrific up there. And we had plenty of gear with us, and obviously some food for Josh. And honest, uh, by the time me and Jim, John James got the stay head to walk up the escorts, we were drenched, we were tired, we were energy levels were, were, were low because the temperature was dropping. And how these two kept running, we were in a clue. And we thought, John and James thought, oh, they may be packed in by the time they get the escorts, with any luck. But no, 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 by the time they come to the escorts, and as Josh rightly says, any food, no, Josh, have you got any, oh, by the way, have you got any sweets because we could do with some. And John James and I just jogged down over the um, Great End down to Stye Head. We went up the top of Gable with you, didn't we? Yeah, we got past uh, stretcher box about 300 yards. No, and you no. were, you and were then I, then I, then I bailed out. And John James carried on a bit more and then just chased him down. And 
I would never so glad to get to the bottom of it if it was the way. Well, you know, he was I, getting into your bone oh, it, you know, no. it was serious because you, you had them big. We had them big fishman tags on, you know, that were down to your ankles. Yeah. <laughs> so Ken Ladd was testing for somebody and he gave us them. And they were, they were a bit heavy to carry, like. But, anyways, we went them in bad when we left Pauly Bridge. Yeah. We thought it was best to take them. And we put them on, you know, just after we left. Uh, got the stretcher box because it, it was getting in your bones then. Yeah. Aye. And then when we got them to what the wall end on, on the scorch, Colin had uh, get a, another cag out of his bag and put on underneath to maintain body heat. Wow. And the shape were glued back at wall uh, on scorch. And they weren't running out at road when you come towards them. <laughs> you should have. Right. Aye. You couldn't believe it could be so cold. And we got on the top of Aircock and we could hardly get off. We couldn't get off after on, on the end. It was on his back. So we come back, sort of left handed down a bit of a scree bed. And Colin was taking arm then, you know, he was running out of fuel. And anyway, I told him to nip on when I was going up onto uh, Sea Talon to where he could see us get the cane. And I just went up the back side, you know, along the, under the skyline, yeah. and then come up at the uh, Shrig Point. And just at that point, the wind dropped and he tired. And I could see Colin and I waved to him. And then I nipped and catched up to him on Middlefeld. And we sat on top of Middlefeld for a couple of minutes and we jogged down. And I laid down in back when I got down. And it was warmer in the back than it was out. <laughs> it was disgusting. Aye. Can you remember what time you did it in that first time? It was 11 and a half hours. Unbelievable. But we'd have been, we'd have done it in ten like then, because yeah. you know, I'd not, Colin's a big strong lad, and I was pulling him along like. Yeah. Aye. But uh, that was that was sort of time we we're going to do like, but you know, it was unbelievable. Absolutely incredible. There was no hikers out anyways. No. No. <laughs> Friend of Papa's. I mean, I've asked a few people this, and I suppose it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on it. But what what is it about? Running in the mountains, running in the fells, that, that that that's obviously appealed to you for so long. I I think the tranquility, you know, yeah. of it all, you know, it's something you can't describe, because it's an enjoyment. If your body's right and your mind's right, you take so much in and you just go relax and enjoy it all. Yeah. Aye. But you've got to be in a good state of mind and a good, you know, state of body mm -hmm. to go and, you know, get the benefit out of things. At that extreme, like you know, yeah, I, I you know, I had some fantastic runs, you know, really pleasurable days, like you know, and I used to always try, try and be back in six hours and done them, you know, really long runs, yeah, because you, you know, the pace was good and I was climbing well and I wasn't burning a lot of fuel off, you know what I mean, I, you know, you do it all a miles by hour and just <laughs> come back, you get a I just scrubbed down in back and then we got some of the eight you recovered and you were out and worked like, you right. know, just as simple as that. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe simple as that for you. Some people would be lying down for a week. Well, no, but, but you know, it's, just, like that. it's just, just the way your body was. Got. But how about training for some of the other races, like the Ennerdale race? Uh, the Ennerdale, it, it always come at a bad time, like, yeah. because at that time when I should have been, you know, winning them. And, I know I won nine, which was you know a good number, but a lot of, a lot of that time you, you you had a job to get a train and run in, because it was time of year I was trying to get me owls and lambs back on the fell, mm -hmm. and my brother was sort of starting farming you know on his own, and it was that time of year when the early taters were on, and you know nearly every week weekday you would have a couple of ton of taters to pick in the morning to be picked up at dinner time, like, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, them little taties, it takes a fair lot of them for two ton when you... Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, you know, and you just... I know there was one year there when Dave Cannon was at, uh, staying at Blacksdale Oats and uh, he was fancying his chance to win the, win the Annadale. And Jim Strickland, like, you know, he, he used to run the warden at that time at Black Sellers. And he come over to see it a couple of times, saying my training was gone. And he said, well, I said, I said, I haven't had time to have a run yet, uh, Jim. 
but I said I'll have to try and get a bottle taken out one night, you know, because I used to try and have a bottle of, it was it's one of them curling salt tablets with it was handy spot because you can sit down on a couple there and uh, it just give you a boost that little bottle I had. It had a cooling salt tablet in. <laughs> Three tablespoonfuls of uh, glucose. Right. And that would guarantee to get us back to uh, the scout camp. <laughs> and that particular day, like when Dave Cannon was running, I had, that was the only training run I had that ten days. I took that bottle out. I had that much work on, yeah. you know. It was just about time we did the potato picking and getting the owls and lambs not out. And anyway, that, that night I had a, a run to Blackback Town. I come back up over Green Gable and dropped in and come back down the road by Beckhead and, and Gable Knees. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But on the day of the race, like Dave Cannon, you know, he was one of the top felons at that time. And uh, there was him and a lad called John Godin of the city of Stoke. I can remember that name. Yeah. Never, and I only ever saw him that once that morning. And him and Dave Cannon, they set off at a hell of a rate of knots, and I just stuck him behind them till I got to the bottom of Red Pike. And there's a bit of nice green running that runs off to a little place called White Pike where we sort of cut through and run underneath it. And I dropped him on there, like, the, you know, and he could run five minute miles, could Dave Cannon. But uh, I did a little bit more juice in my tank at that. Right. I got away from him. I, and, I, you know, I, I, he would think I hadn't that sort of speed in my legs, like. But anyways, I got another, another shock that morning. Because you're kind of legendary, aren't you, for running from your home in Wasdale to the start of races and then doing uh, your races and then running back. Was that because you didn't have a car or just because you... What, well, like sometimes. I know that first bottle race, I think I ran to start and ran back home, like. Yeah. I and ran to race. And I know Odd Mountain Trail, there's one at Esdale. And that, that was an absolute beautiful day, like, you know. And uh, it was when Jack Maitland wouldn't fell under the air. And you know, and that race, I only seen I think one runner till I was coming back. You know, to, that was two thirds way th through the race. Mm. I dropped into Langle. You know, just to in, enjoy the day, like you know, I wasn't bothered about winning anything. I don't know what position I f finished or anything. Right. But anyways, I got that checkpoint. I think that was maybe the second checkpoint. I and I dropped into Langdon while all the others were going over the top. You know, over crinkles, mm -hmm. skirt and bow fell and and I think they were dropping me in to cut back through from top of Skirgill to Langford Dub. And anyways, when I clung back out of my trip through under Langdon Pikes and that, everybody had gone. I dropped into Langford Dub and I think I was the last there. And just as I got to the top of Brown Tongue, I looked and I counted 70 runners in, all in the line. Right. I, uh, so I just put my head down. And before I got to the next checkpoint, which was the two ta little towns on top of the screes, that was it. Right. And I knew it was five minutes faster to go over the top, but I thought <laughs> when I got amongst them, I was just running underneath them. And I was just, you know, passing one after the other. And I thought, well, if I go over the top, I, you know, I'll, I'll maybe not be running as fast as I should. And anyways, just before I got to the checkpoint, there was Jack Maitland coming back, and he was fell under the air that time. And I checked, got my card checked, and coming down back at Scrays, I didn't half leg it. And we were climbing out this little bit of a climber called, uh, what was it, Brown Tongue, Brown Tongue. Bought out, oh, that's what they called it. And over top of the road, there was this little place, it was like a little dry gill. It would have a bit of water in it, you know, when it rained. And it was streaming path checkpoint. Right. And I was still passing them. And they were to pass Jack Maitland, who was fell under the air that year. But, and, you know, and then Dave Orley was se second and fell under the air. I was still passing them. And I could see about maybe another 20 or 30 in front. 
So I put my head down past them, and Dave Hall was leading them. And he, he shouts, Josh. I says, what? He said, just hang on a minute, I want to run in with you. So anyways, I eased off, and Dave ran with us till uh, right hand checkpoint. And then we dropped back into Dale Garth. Right. And I don't know where to finish. Catch Jack, Jack Maitland, right. Dave Hall, they uh, were champion and fell in us that year. Brilliant. And I still had the legs to, to, to beat them, you know. And have a run in as well. Yeah, I, good. you know, and then I just sat, sat, got a cup of tea and a, a bun of tart, sat down the sun ate them, then I ran back over Burn Moor and at that home, like, uh, I'd probably run there in the morning, like, yeah. from home. Uh, right. But it was just a lovely day, like, you know, mm -hmm. aye. And that was another mountain trial I finished. Uh, uh. There's a pure joy when you talk about your running. I can see it in your face. Just, aye, you know, but that day backwards. was just so much special, mm -hmm. aye. I know Billy passed it in the morning. I said, you know where you're going, lad? And he said, aye. <laughs> aye. And uh, I, 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 when I, you know, I just give it a tremendous lift just to, you know, come through the field and finish like that. Right. Talking of lifts though, Josh, one of the things that you've become kind of um, more recently famous for is supporting other runners when they're out in their challenges. So you uh, were out, so you're out supporting Sabrina um, uh, on her way rights challenge. I'd yeah. like to see them getting a bit of encouragement. Yeah. I, like Sabrina and those girls, we've got a good team of girls now, like, you know, and they do a tremendous job for Lady Sport, like, I, you know, and... Uh, We've got three or four of them, you know, the really top, yeah. top lasses, and uh, they've got my respect. Like, mm -hmm. so Brain is something very, very special. Like, I read that article in there, uh, fellow when she did the coast to coast in Storm Bella. And I tell you what, that storm was a storm now, probably as bad a storm we've ever had in this country. Mm. And that little lady did the coast to coast. Uh, in that weather, yeah, uh, she's so vulnerable, like anybody. Mm -hmm. But I tell you what, she's so tough yeah. as well, and she just takes it in her stride. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she doesn't she just doesn't let it get into the yeah. body. No, and it does, and it does give it does give the athletes a boost to see you out there. I mean, I know, oh. I, you know, when I was talking about you have been out with Sabrina, we. Uh, she was just about heading over um, Melbrick. That's right. Uh, and it was a bit of a slog up there, and I think there was uh, she was vi you know, visibly lifted by, uh, by you being uh, there. So. Uh, it just gives you tremendous pleasure just seeing them, mm. you know, to think, well, there's someone still doing these things mm. and doing them well, like, you know. Uh, Do you ever get any kind of pangs of regret when you see people kind of taking your records, or are you, or are you kind of happy for them to... <laughs> it doesn't bother us one no. bit. Uh, it's just good to see them out there doing it. You know, and you know, be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Aye, aye. Yeah. And what about the future of the sport? So, eventually, we've got some great ladies coming up. I mean, we've got Jasmine, we've got Carol Morgan, we've got um, Sabrina, we've already mentioned, and many others. Aye, well, and the Nikki Spinks, Nikki's done a tremendous mm -hmm. lot. You know, she's a very clever woman and she allowed anybody, you know, anywhere at any time. Yeah. Aye, and very special people, like, mm -hmm. you know, they were willing to put so much back into the sport. Aye. Yeah. Which is just what the sport was all right. set up to be. Yeah. Aye. So what do you think's your legacy, Josh, when people think about Josh Naylor? <laughs> what did what did Well, I was just born with something that probably the told us about one out one person in about a million laugh. Has a pair of big lungs, no bone structure, mm. their arms are like bloody matchsticks, so my legs. I haven't got a muscle about us. And that's the way you've got to be. Mm. You know, the Ethiopians and the uh, Nigerians and these sort of people, you know, they're sort of the same build as I am. And you're just built to run. Yeah. I, I know I missed most of my life with an injury. And, and it was not to do with running, like, mm. no. But uh, I've had a lot of pressure what I've done. I, You've given a lot of pleasure to a lot of people as well in terms of them watching you achieve the things you've achieved. Ah, that's good. You know, it's uh, been something very special, really. Mm. Aye. You know, and uh, it's nice just to go out and see people like Sabrina and yeah. Nikki and 
Jasmine and these lasses, and you know, there's a generation that should be put on a pedestal for lady athletes to follow, I reckon. Yeah. Because they're all in the same frame of mind, you know, the low level people, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what it's all about. Yes. Aye. Right. Thank you, Joss. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Yeah, well, I um, hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it enlightens a few people. It will do. You know, uh, it's uh, just great to be alive, you know. Uh, great. Uh, Fantastic attitude. Yes. Wonderful.